Yeah. But you want to have still you want to have that that nutrients those nutrients available during that peri and post workout period, and that's why it, for someone who takes in, for instance, a big post work pre workout meal, which means they're going to be they're not going to be post absorptive for a long time. You've got the nutrients coming in. If you take in an 800 calorie meal, let's say an hour before you work out, and that's fine. You got those nutrients coming in just as if you would if you'd had an intra workout. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like you, you, so, you solve the issue of making sure there's nutrients available. It's different than if you fast for two hours beforehand and two hours afterwards, and you've got like a five or six hour gap with no no calories. That's the types of things you might see in a study where they've where they've tried to eliminate the the timing issue, and that's you know that's something people would never really do in a real world scenario. Yeah. But the thing, and I'll add this, is that if someone, for instance, is not doing an intra workout and they're at the end of an off season where the the calories are maxed, they're missing out on time during the day when they could be taking in food. Yeah, and you get used to taking in those intra workouts. Mm -hmm. There's an adaptation that comes with that. That's been demonstrated in some of the endurance cycling literature where um, cyclists take in carbohydrates at maximal rates while they're exercising. And you, you, your GI disturbances will go down. You just get used to it. you got to find the right carbs and protein sources for you, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. But, but so if someone's got to take in six 6,000 calories a day, let's say, and they do that, they do that if, if they didn't have an intra workout, they try to do that in like maybe four meals because they don't want to eat anything an hour beforehand. And after, for an hour afterwards, they're just not hungry. Well, then they've got four 1,500-calorie meals, and those meals are pretty friggin' big. Yeah. But the, otherwise, maybe they do 1,000-calorie meals. Yeah. So they have a 1,000-calorie meal an hour and a half, two hours before, and they can do a 1,000-calorie intra-workout, which is not out of, the, out of the ballpark. I've done over 2,000-calorie ones in the past. Just, right, okay. I'm not going to suggest that, but I did that just no. as a concept type of thing many years ago. Yeah, yeah. And then you do another thousand calories, you know, half an hour, an hour after you worked out when you get home. You, you've now multitasked and taken yeah. that, you know, four hour block of time where you didn't have anything coming in. And instead of having to stay up later at night to fit your food in or wake up at night and lose sleep, you can, you can multitask and spread those calories out over the day and yeah. potentially have a new timing effect on recovery. Potentially, probably not so much because there's so many calories anyway, but at least you relieve the gastric distress to some degree. At least that's what I find with many people because you just manage to spread the food out over the day. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's yeah. more food than you need anyway. We're still, we're still not doing the body any, like, any great service here. It's not like, you know, no, it's like, no, oh, no. being so nice. Like, no, you're still pushing the food. You're still eating <laughs> yeah. when you wouldn't otherwise want to. But this is a way to make it a little bit easier, I think, and maybe get a little bit better sleep. Not have the distended belly, which which you know can be an issue with people with keeping yeah. tight waistline, because you're not eating as much in those. You don't have those giant meals that just leave you feeling pregnant. Yeah, food. yeah, 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 yeah. So there's an advantage there, but at some point the nutrient timing is not nutrient timing. It's just figuring out how to get the food in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So what do you you know when you've trained? You know, you were talking about you might add honey and things like that to when will you sort of cap that off before to you go the slower sort of burning carbohydrates like the brown rice so would you maybe still have the really fast stuff within an hour after the workout or something like that but then go to the brown rice and things later on in the day when dieting down you mean um, uh, or even off season do you do the nutrient timing off season as well yeah, so that's what I was saying. We would you build up with in the post contest period. So yeah, yeah. And initially, you t you might take in the brown rice in that in that first meal because your hunger is so high. Yeah, you want the carbohydrates. Yeah. You want to add those in, and then yeah. a month a month later, you need to add more food. And so then you go with the faster acting. You have the cereal yeah, after, yeah. It tastes good, yeah. and yeah. then the brown rice will be in the second meal. Mm -hmm. And then eventually your carbohydrates are so high, the brown rice isn't a good option for you anymore. That's three months down the road. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You're filling yeah. out, you've gone from the, the first week post-show, say 200 grams in those two meals, two meals post-workout, to yeah. four months down the show, after mm -hmm. the show, or five months after the show, now you're at 1,000 grams. So what mm -hmm. you've done is added 800 grams of carbs, 200 grams You've added, let's see, you've added 50 grams of carbs to the two post-workout meals per week, every week for four months, basically. Yeah. So that's, yeah. 
that gets you to almost, I think that's dead on what I was just sort of throwing in my head. That's, that's yeah. a very re- realistic scenario. But now when you've got a thousand grams of carbs, you don't want to do brown rice. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to have, have to do something that comes yeah. in more quickly. So, but yeah. that would happen incrementally. And this is the thing, and I, I think you're still a little caught on this. So I'm going to, I'm going to reiterate this point is that diets are dynamic. They're not mm-hmm. static. It's not like, how do you eat? It's like, it changes all the time depending on what absolutely, my body yeah. demands yeah. are yeah. and where I am in terms of caloric excess or balance. So yeah. those, and, and it may be that, you know, I do well with the brown rice all the way through. I can do that. It works great yeah. for me. I mean, maybe because it, it carries over to the next day. I don't, I don't feel terribly bloated. I, I found a really nice combination of probiotics and yeah. I'm using a digestive enzyme. And this brown rice that I get is like this super special stuff from the Asian market that is just wonderful or who knows. Yeah. So it, every year is different. Every prep is different. Every yeah, I'm just trying to get that across yeah. from you because I know a lot of people ju- will just stick to the same thing you know, all the time, and you, you've kind of got to change it to what suits you best at that actual time, you know, yeah. and over time you change it. Well, it, it's, it's, it's really no different, except that you, you change directions going back and forth with muscle yeah, yeah. body plus, then progressive overload in the gym. Yeah, absolutely, it's, yeah. It's like, yeah. so, so like, you, it'd be asking, like, someone, so what weights do you use on bench press? Yeah. I use the heaviest ones I can handle for the reps and the sets that I'm doing. It's like, well, yeah. why don't you stick with 95? That that worked right off the, the work before when you started. I'm like, yeah, but I was 12 and I weighed 100. Yeah. Pounds. It's like, <laughs> now I'm 223. Yeah. I'm not going to use 95 yeah. pounds. Yeah. And people would, obviously that's facetious. That's laughable. But yeah. the diet is exactly the same. Mm-hmm. And yeah. like that's, people say, people message me. So I was like, hey, but how much for a one-off diet? You know, and I'm like, that's, why don't you just send me the money? There's no point in that. Like, you know, that's. <laughs> It's useless. Yeah. It, I, now yeah. you can look at someone's diet and say, okay, can you remedy some of the things that may be missing that I'm, you know, doing right or wrong? You know, it's like, okay, yeah. well, you know, I, I wouldn't eat, you know, all the prepackaged sandwich meats, you know, you, you yeah. might want to like, find a different source of meats, you yeah. know, those sorts of things that, that there's very yeah. much value in that, Definitely. but the diet is always going to change and food. Uh, it's hard, hard to find this in the literature, but people can develop food intolerances eating the yeah. same thing all the time. It's like, I just, or they just don't want to eat anymore. So having some variety, there's so much dynamic and, and different that can change there. But, um, so yeah, it's funny. Like some people too, like that, that post-workout period, um, it may not be worth it for them to really push that as high as they can go. Some yeah. people, they can push that and the, and they just soak up the calories and they're ready for it. And they don't mind being hungry. They're more productive when they're a little bit hungry on the non-training days. And they schedule things that are more cognitive in nature on those days. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Better. And they don't get a big bloated gut because they found the right combination of foods, et cetera. And then other people are like, you know what? I got the five. I can't do any more than 500 grams of carbs here. We're going to just have to put it in someplace else. And that's totally fine. So, yeah. you know, how much do you expand that and the relative um, uh, placement of the food in terms of just calories and the macronutrients Perry and post-workout, as opposed to non-training days, is another huge variable that can depend yeah. on the person. Um, I mean, <laughs> gosh, I mean, you can think of a, a husband who comes home, you know, and it's like, okay, so he's late for dinner, like the whole family has to wait because those are his training days. He comes home, and then he's just this miserable glutton the whole night, and his wife was like, yeah. Honey, all you do is train and eat, you know, and then he's like starving the next night, you know, because he's just yeah. waiting for, you know, the training to happen the next day. And like, <laughs> it just creates so much mayhem that it just isn't worth it for him to yeah. do that. So instead, he makes those meals yummy. It's like, oh, this is when she can make those sweet potatoes that I really love for dinner. And yep. she can make a good, nice meal that we can all enjoy. And I can have maybe a little sorbet, which is low fat for dessert. And, yep. and that works well. And he's not a bloated monster you know, with gas and, you know, he's snoring because he's so swollen from the, there's all sorts of things that can happen. So it's, you know, there's so many variables that come into play there, but I've got this kind of outlined in my fortitude training, actually both of my books, I, I kind of cover this, okay. this idea, but, um, the nutrient for those people, especially those who can really create this sort of massive displacement between lots of food in that post-workout period and not like the kind of hunger that makes you you know, woozy and lightheaded and just like, you know, completely um, thinking about food, distracted by food, preoccupied with what you're going to eat. 
but a, but a little bit hungry and ready to soak in those nutrients post workout. People who can create that sort of disparity um, in large part and and work with that over the course of an off season, they tend to have really good improvements in body composition. Yeah, it's, yeah. It just seem. I mean, it, I know it's not magical, but it seems to work really, really well for many people. Now, you know, obviously I'm biased, and I'm you know that's not a controlled experiment there. You know, mm-hmm. but those people are probably going to be successful because they can do that and they're willing to do yeah. that, that anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's not like it's a random selection of people. So how do you adjust carbohydrates? You know, if you say doing the, um, the intra and the post, what, what if the workouts are very, very short, sort of super intense, but very, very short, say compared to someone that's doing like more of a volume style workout, would you adjust the carbohydrates for the length of the session? Or do you still put more carbohydrates in just because how hard the actual sets are on the lower volume? Yeah, it's definitely going to match the demands. So that was the kind of yeah. the general theory is that it's going to match the demands of the training. So, um, for instance, like at one extreme, you might have someone who's doing DC dog crap training, DC training, mm-hmm. yeah. where you know you warm up, get yourself ready, but the the, the volume and the, the number of work sets is pretty low. Yeah, compared to someone who's you know doing like a kind of a more of a bro split and they're training five times a week, you wouldn't uh, with DC training want to take in like a thousand you know or a, a 1200 1500 gram shake you know 500 or a, a 300 400 gram carbohydrate shake you don't need that it yeah. might if your if your day was such that that was what you needed to do because you just couldn't find time to eat at work yeah and you want to get that food in then then that might that might make sense but you may not need if you don't have the caloric expenditure you're not using up that glycogen there is a point in which in time, you know, those extra carbs are going to go to fat. There's, those calories aren't needed yeah. at that time point. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if you're someone who's doing the high volume, like a Jay Cutler style training. Yeah, um, you need a lot. Yeah. And I mean, Jay was someone, you know, who took in massive amounts of carbs. You can find some, I think yeah, he's dying about a thousand grams a day or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't seem like very much even for someone as big as he was and how yeah. much training he did. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. It would, it would totally match. And it would also, there's, there's, you know, there's, depends on how much people can tolerate, depends on how they want to take in their carbohydrates. Some people want to eat their, as much food as possible. And I am totally for that, you know, as much as, yeah. as much as you can. It's just when you're training hard, especially if it's hot or you tend to get really hot when you train, you've just got those gastric, you know, limitations that are brought mm-hmm. on by the yeah. nature of the exercise. So that's why supplements can be useful is because yeah. they let you take in food when you wouldn't otherwise. Yeah. Um, you know, rice well, and chicken would be a good choice during your workout, probably. That's gone on nicely, to be honest, because I wanted to ask you about um, what supplements you sort of use or recommend, particularly. I know pre-contest can be a little bit more important if the food's lower, but is there anything you sort of recommend supplement-wise sort of as a year-round thing? Well, I look at supplements sort of in the, in the grand scheme of things. So I'm... Um, I'm a licensed acupuncturist. I maintain my license. I'm not right. actively practicing, but so I'm a I'm a board certified Chinese herbalist as well. So I, I look at look at dietary supplements in the grand scheme of things and in, in the ways. And this is all there's a whole chapter, a big section that's in my book. Is that those would be sort of prescribed or chosen based on the, the individual's needs. Yeah. So a lot of times people think supplements like so. What are the ones that are going to help us? You know that we 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 know in a bodybuilding context have ergogenic actions and anabolic actions. It's like, well, you know, we're talking about basically creatine, um, carbohydrate, obviously, just generally speaking, uh, protein. So if you're someone who can't get all their protein through food, then use a protein supplement. You yeah. can't really um, create and load very well with meat, so you take in a creatine supplement. Some people might find that beta alanine, some of those supplements have an ergogenic effect. I mean, so does, so does sodium bicarbonate, but that's not something you want to yeah. use on a regular basis, <laughs> probably no. unless you like diarrhea. Like, um, <laughs> so uh, water is super important. That may be something where you have to like literally yeah. consider supplementing. You know, yes. someone's. Yeah. I mean, I've I've got clients that just don't like to drink a whole lot, so I say, okay, so get. Do you like fizzy water? It's like, yeah, I love it. It's like, well, get get a soda stream, and you can get a little liquid stevia and add some lemon juice to that. And you're not yeah, t- yeah. taking a bunch of you know artificial sweeteners that might. You, you get that a lot in this country, to be honest, with the water, because obviously most of the year it's cold, so right. a lot of people don't particularly want to drink lots of fluids, you know, because of that. 
Yeah. Whereas like when I said to you, when I would in States and it's red hot, it's so much easier to sort of get the fluid in, you know, each day. Yeah, yeah. So, but also bodybuilding puts so many demands on our whole system as well. So sleep aids can be important for many people, for yeah. instance. Finding yeah. one that works for them, and it would differ depending on where you're on the world, what you can actually get. Um, I cover all the various ingredients there, everything from, you know, threonine, L-tryptophan, valerian, um, melatonin, obviously. A lot of people have really good effects with taking, like, really high doses of melatonin. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, digestive aids. So, you know, if you're not a very – if you don't eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, um, you don't get many prebiotics by way of, um, you know uh, – onions and garlic and leek and those sorts of things and not you're not eating you know fermented foods you may yep. need to find you know some a probiotic or maybe start eating those things as well sort of mm -hmm. supplementing yeah. by just those foods yeah a lot um, of people use digestive enzymes and probiotics now don't they, just to help with the gastric you know yeah GI absolutely trap. yeah um you know there's also all the health aids that are involved so people are like well should i take something from my liver i'm like well what is your, you know, what does your blood work tell you? Do you have reason to believe that mm -hmm. your liver is unhealthy, um, yeah. first and foremost? So the interesting thing, it's kind of, kind of fascinating, and this is, this opens up cans of worms in various ways. But for instance, as far as the liver goes, many of the many of the supplements that help with liver health are actually, in a certain sense, they're toxic, in that mm -hmm. they produce a free radical stress that invokes the uh, free radical quenching abilities of our cells to um, that's a NRF2 pathway. People can look that up if they want to kind of dig in on this. But basically those send a signal that there is a potential free radical stress that tells our liver cells that, hey, you got to up the ante. We need to be able to handle free radicals as part of our detoxication system. So uh, those turn on the body's own free radical defenses because they're slight toxins. Yeah. So those can be helpful, for instance. Um, silymarin and acetyl L-cysteine is a, acetyl -cysteine, actually it's just a pre, uh, an antioxidant of itself, but many of those herbal formulations that you can get, like in liver 52, those are actually toxic to some degree in of themselves, but overall they help because they urge the body into taking care of itself better. You, yeah. you may not need those if you don't have any reason to believe that you're... Um, uh, having any liver stress, you're not taking in a bunch of oral steroids, or yeah. you don't see this in your blood work, uh, or there's nothing environmental that you know of. Um, sometimes people can also shotgun these things and take in too much. So um, if you decide you're going to take, like uh, like Liver Armor is the name of one herbal-based supplement that people would take in, yeah. and Liver 52 um, from Himalayan Herbal and Udka, or Tudka, you know, you can end up like basically um, piggybacking several products that all have the same action and yeah. me mega dosing things in a way you didn't know because basically you're evoking the same uh, reactivity, the same responses in those hepatic cells through all of those different supplements. Or you can end up mega dosing antioxidants, which yeah. can actually Im impair the adaptive processes that are involved with muscle growth. The free right. radical stress that comes about from training is part of what triggers the adaptation that gives us mm -hmm. muscle growth and mitochondrial biogenesis, et cetera, et cetera. So people want to take supplements with like vitamin C at 1,000 milligrams or acetyl L-cysteine or various other free radical quenching, just pure antioxidants, that you never would find in any food um, that's considered healthy. And you can end up just literally countering the stimulus that you're trying to evoke by going yep. into training because there's some sort of a stress and the stress is mediated by free radical production. If you quench that, you quench the stress. It's yeah. kind of, it's kind of like you set a fire up to do make smoke, smoke signals to send, Hey, SOS. And you're putting a hose on the fire at the same time. Like you get no smoke with no fire. That's what yeah. antioxidants can do. Mm -hmm. So, or you can stress out the liver by, by putting in too many herbs and has to then process those because those are, those are, have free radical actions under themselves, which in the right amounts evoke a protective mechanism, but in excessive amounts may, may just create excessive stress. Yeah. So yeah. like right. green tea is an example. Green tea can be toxic. Yeah. In excess. You'll find that among in the, the uh, polyphenols in there 
um, epigallocatechin gallate, et cetera, et cetera. Those, those, those can actually be toxic in high amounts. Mm -hmm. So, but, but also they can be free radical quenching too. And the so, trouble is, as bodybuilders, we tend to take too much of everything, though. No? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> We're never going in small amounts. That's the yeah. Problem. So, so you want to you want to look at what potential stresses are. Like, is your GI fine? You need to spend you know hundred dollars a month on on uh, um, enzymes. Yeah. Um, or, or do you want to entrain that in your system, where like literally your system, you're taking in enzymes unnecessarily? You know, can you have get a detraining or an atrophying of the pancreas? If you take yeah. in pancreatic enzymes for years, I don't know. It would make sense it's possible, but if you don't mm -hmm. need them, then don't do that. But if you're taking in 8,000 calories and you're constantly bloated, probably you've, be, you've gone beyond what your system has probably been engineered yeah, for. Yeah, able to do. Yeah. So it yeah. makes sense. So sleep's important. Rest recovery is important. Not ablating the stimulus with too many antioxidants. Um, uh, and also the ergogenic and potential anabolic aids like, you know, creatine or, or protein powder so it all depends on the person and where, where what you're trying to do there, there's meant to be supplements that yeah. match the demands and the individual stresses the person might have so even like like nootropics you know for instance those can be phenomenal i've never gotten much out of you know the various paracetams and no pept and things like that i've never noticed anything from that yeah I'm not sure why. I mean, there's there's all, all sorts of er mushrooms that have nootropic effects. I've never noticed much from that. Tried lithium orotate, nothing from that. But for some people, it gives them a sense of calm, a sense of wellness, a sense of focus, which could very well be very positive in terms of lowering, lowering cortisol, keeping their days stress free, keeping them ready and in a gr good mindset to go in and train. You know, if you can go through your day and have a stress level of five as opposed to eight. That that is definitely definitely going to be helpful, I think, from a body loading perspective. Yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, you know, as long as you haven't given yourself a frontal lobotomy that makes it impossible to train hard, you know, and you're just like, well, yeah. I guess I'm just going to go in and train today. I don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> that may not work, you yeah, know. Yeah. But but you get my point. So it depends on the person and what that does for them. Um, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's you know, we we tend to look at so many things because it's. It's a great place to start. Is it good or bad and how much and what? And yeah. it's really all about very, very much the dynamic equilibrium is the, is the term that's used for homeostasis. And we're, we're trying to basically disrupt homeostasis in the body by doing a very unnatural act and at the same time keep homeostasis in place to some degree so we don't, don't you know, kill ourselves. So we're trying to urge our body to go places where, that it's capable of and eke out performance and adaptational capacities that um, normally wouldn't happen with yeah. for instance, weight training. We're, we're basically hijacking our, our, the genetic programs for putting on muscle mass in yeah. various yeah. ways and then trying to like patch up all the bits and places. It's like, it's like throwing turbo into your car. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, the car can handle this, but we're, you know, we're not doing any, our gearing is getting all screwed up and our tires are getting too hot. So, you know, we got to do all these other things to, you know, make sure we keep the performance vehicle put together. Yeah. And you have to be very careful as to how you do that. You know, if, um, I'm just, I, I don't know anything about race cars, but, you know, let's just say that like one of the things with like Indy 500 cars is their tires get really hot, you know? So I think yeah. I've seen they spray down the tires, you know, so that they yeah, better yeah, yeah. So, like, what if you just said, well, instead of using water, let's just put dry ice on those tires. That'll yeah. really soak up the heat, right? And then the next thing you know, you're just, you're, you're crippling the rubber, and the rubber just starts breaking off, and you drive away, yeah. and you have tires for half a lap, and they just fall apart. That was yeah. too much cooling. That wasn't appropriate, mm -hmm. given the stresses that are involved. So that would be like shotgun. I'm going to take all the antioxidants I can, because we don't want any free radical stress. People won't do that nowadays. I think people are more aware. But that sort of thing is like, oh, my liver, I'm, I, you know, I started on D-ball. I need to take liver, something to support my liver. It's yeah. like, okay, so I'm going to take every liver aid I possibly can. Like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Boxes, you get an Amazon package the size of a pickup truck. <laughs> it's like, no, that's too much. Now you, like, yeah. now you could be, you know, undoing or creating greater liver stress from all the, um, yeah. so yeah. you have to be really selective. And it's just like an herbalist. People, I get asked a question actually on a YouTube video that had nothing to do with this. Like, what should I take? I don't remember what it was. It was some for some medical issue. I'm like, I have no I, no idea. You'd have to go see an acupuncturist and get a specific diagnosis. It's sort of yeah. 
sort of like, um, you know, I've got uh, chest pain. What should I take? It's like, well, you could just have, you know, you, you could have a bacterial overgrowth. You could have just some, you know, regurge that an ant antacid would work. It could be that you've got angina pectoris and need nitroglycerin yeah. or you need a, a trip to the ER. It could be a million things. You yeah, have to diagnose yeah. as best you can and then apply. And the same thing, supplements are, are not benign, but, you know, less so than, than pharmaceuticals. But you got to be really specific, I think, is my mm -hmm. main point as yeah. to what you would use. So um, that's that's my long answer to... to yeah, no, no, that's great. That's great. If we yeah. could go back to the training just for a second, Scott, yeah. I, I completely forgot that. Um, what exercise selection do you recommend? Do you, do you more go compounds? Do you do both isolations and compounds or what, what sort of your, particularly volume flow, would you be looking more at the big compound movements more than the isolations? Most people on those, on those loading sets, the heavy go-to, like big mass builders, we got it. We, not that this is not a universal law, but mm -hmm. the hardest stuff tends to make for the best growth. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, you know, when I, I see this is the one thing sometimes I'm like, oh man, I wish I could just flip the switch on that person's mindset. I'll, I'll go in the gym and I'll, you know, see someone that I've never seen doing deadlifts or rack deads or bent over barbell rows or see, but they're doing face pulls, you know, they'll do eight sets of yeah, face. Yeah. See that's that like, all the time. That's like, yeah, like just don't like the heavy hard stuff is the stuff it, it, it gets you used to training harder, which carries over. And that yeah. tends to be the best for putting on size for many, many people. Mm -hmm. Not Squats are a great example. Works for some, doesn't work for others. Depends on how you do them. Yeah. So for the loading sets, the exercise would be those, those sets that you can, that you know produce muscle growth because you've got experience to show that this is the case and that you feel really comfortable progressively overloading on. Yeah. Um, and they just lend themselves best to that. At the other end of the spectrum for those, for those, the set type that I call the pump sets, those are going to be usually isolation exercises, cables, things that give a really nice loading curve relative to the strength curve for those isolation movements um, that lets you focus as, and target as much on a particular muscle group as possible without having neurological demands being going off to accessory muscles. So you wouldn't want to do a back squat, for instance, for a pump set because mm – -hmm. That would be a 20 or 30 rep set, and you probably would end up with a, more of a low back pump than a leg pump in many mm -hmm. cases. So yeah. that, that's like a, a kind of an obvious example. Instead, yeah. I'd have people doing isolation movements like a knee extension um, yeah. if that doesn't cause chondromalacia types of issues or various other quad isolation exercises I've kind of thrown in the mm -hmm. mix for people. Smith yeah. sissy hacks are a great one or somersault squats, some sort of a sissy squat, close, low leg press, something like that. Yeah. So things where you can really focus and, and do that safely and also take, it depends on what you're doing as far as failure too. I didn't mm -hmm. mention this, but on those loading sets, depending on the volume tier, the compound exercises would not be taken to failure one or two reps in the tank, except for the last one, if you can do that safely and exit the machine. Because you're, if you fail and the, the weight's on the bottom of the rack, you're going to have to get the plates off of there and it's just not going to work yeah. with very well. It's yeah. not practical. Um, whereas with the pump sets, you want to like maintain, it's literally as if you have like a, a minute or two to get pumped up before you go on stage, how are you going to make that happen? So yeah. you would, you might do, do partials, like hamstrings are a great one. You want to do like a pump set on hamstrings, you can do something, um, call them fives into the hole where you do a set of five full reps and then five partials where you feel it best, four reps, five partials where you feel it best, three. Yeah, we do lots of stuff reps. like that. Yeah. 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 And then you can get to the bottom, a lot of hamstring machines because of the way the loading curve is, you can do partials just with a little bit of flexion at the knee and mm -hmm. you can bang out 30 of those. You can hang in that spot and just torture yourself for forever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Those yeah. work really, really well. So – that would be a better choice for a pump set than doing like a stiff legged deadlift where your low back's probably going to be limiting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you save those for the loading sets and maybe the muscle mm -hmm. rounds. Um, yeah. I have a whole set of selection. Um, I don't, it's not that big of a deal, but basically muscle rounds just to be safe. You don't want to yeah. be taking uh, the portions of that cluster set to, close to failure where you're having to walk things back and forth to rack them. You want to be able to right. stop 
the, the set of four and then pick right up without having to, you know, expend any energy moving the weight around. Yeah. 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 That's real important. I see people doing, doing things, you know, that, that they expend about by the time they get into the set, it's like, you're going to fall over and hurt yourself more likely than be able to take this to failure. So you have to be just smart depending on the set type. Yeah. Yeah. So, What's what's your take on? Sorry, I know I'm asking you a heck of a lot about training and food, but okay. it's just I know lots of people watching want to know so many things. But what's your take on sort of cardiovascular work for even off season as well as pre contest? Do you recommend it, and what what sort of types of cardio do you recommend? Um, I've got a an article on Elite FTS, and this is covered in my in my book too. So. Um, various ways to look at this from a health perspective a lot of the epidemiological evidence shows that simply kind of getting out of the couch potato category is the most important thing for cardiovascular health so Mm -hmm. you've already probably done that yeah training in the gym Um, if you're doing fortitude training there's plenty of cardiovascular there it's brutal yeah yeah Yeah. if you're training really hard if you're doing those heavy big exercises and taking them close to failure You've got lots of cardiovascular stress. Yeah. There's yeah. not really going to be an issue there as far as evoking all the things that come with increased activity levels um, in terms of all-cause mortality and, you know, morbidity from strokes and, and um, heart attacks and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> from a muscle growth perspective, the signal that's being sent from by endurance exercise is sort of um, categorically opposite. It's, it's, yeah, definitely. it's definitely not one that produces, you don't see endurance athletes, marathon runners that look like the Hulk for a reason. Yeah. Stimulus that's evoked there is not one that, that sends a signal to add size to the muscle cell. Yeah. Um, there's no need for that. So then there's a decent amount of literature showing um, there's an interference effect from doing endurance exercise on strength and muscle growth. So the opposite isn't true. The, the strength training won't impair your in, endurance gains. But in terms of gaining size, partly because of maybe the caloric intake issue, but I think a lot of it is probably just molecularly the signaling is, is they're diabolically opposed. Yeah. So, but that varies depending on the person. So um, some people who naturally put on muscle mass really well, and those people sometimes are those who put on body fat really well. They just, they can get big. Getting big and gaining mu- muscle and size is not the issue. It's gaining body fat that's the issue. Yeah. Um, those individuals might want to do some cardio, especially if, they, for instance, they're not very active during the day and they feel better. They st- get up, they start their day, they do some light, let's even fasted cardio because it sets their mind in the right place. Yeah. And then they go and they work a desk job all day long. They might feel much better psychologically to have done that. And if they don't find that it has any impact on their strength gains and their and size in their legs, and there's no issues there, that's a that's phenomenal. That sounds like it's exactly what they should be doing. Yeah. Whereas someone who is struggling, who's just naturally rail thin, they naturally have a large amount of non-exercise activity thermogenesis. They're they're fidgety. They're always talking. They're moving around. Their hands are always here. They're looking around. They're, you know, they they can't sit still. They're always. Can I get you some tea? Can I get you something to eat? It's like, let's see what's on TV tonight. Like, you want to go to the movies? Let me look that up in the, like, someone like that who's constantly expending energy. They, they, they may be someone who's a hard time getting enough food in and gaining, um, to gain weight uh, very well. So those people yeah. might not be, want to do any cardio. Yeah. I personally um, favor, whenever possible, it depends on the person, what helps best with their mental health really is kind of the most, overall well-being is very important for me so that's kind of a big deal yeah yeah in the long run but if uh if someone can take that cardio and make that into something um that is energy an energy expending type of activity that's also life giving i um i call these kind of prep projects or um a life giving type of neat exercise then I prefer they do that. So I personally have yeah. hob- hobbies and projects. I've had a Jeep that I've talked about. I've had a couple of motorhomes. I just got an electric motorcycle. And like when I was have been prepping this year, I go out and work on those things. Right. And I mean, and it gets to be, especially if it's summertime, like I did so much shit to that Jeep, man, like putting new top on it and like putting new bumper. I put 
brand new ranch hand bumpers on my F three fifty. Like those things weigh like three hundred and fifty pounds each, and I'm underneath there bolting yeah. them. It's it's r- ridiculously tough stuff to do, especially <laughs> I have no lift yeah. or anything like that to do it with. Yeah, so it's brutal, but I love it. It's a fun. It's a blast. That's yeah. that's energy expenditure that gives me life. I have something to show for it afterwards. Yeah. So those sorts of things I tend to suggest people do rather than just go and do cardio. Mm-hmm. Now, if they like to do cardio, the first option might be low intensity, steady state, something like that. Just yeah. Yeah. that maybe what will tend to be least interfere with muscle growth. Some people can get away with doing some intervals and they find that works better for fat loss for them. But that will also, that also has to be accounted for when trying to set up the leg training too. Yeah. Yeah. That will, you know, leg, leg, leg strength, maybe just mm-hmm. from a neurological standpoint, if you can't train as hard, you're not going to be able to evoke the stimulus to get m- good muscle growth and yeah. probably just uses up the glycogen that you need when you're training potentially. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm more, I'm more for, and this is the way, you know, I've, it's worked really well with clients is as they get deeper into prep, most of the time relationships start to fail yeah. Life other than bodybuilding or dieting down tends to kind of crumble and become very self-centered and self-focused and unidimensional. And and then if you're increasing your cardio and you're going to the gym and just like sort of spinning your wheels in this you know, zone of drudgery, you know, like, and I always imagine people like they're just rowing the boat, you know, across yeah. the Atlantic, you know, <laughs> like the scene from Conan where he's like, you know, turning the wheel thing around, whatever yeah, that was, sort of, yeah. sort of well, or I don't know what, they were, what that was, but <laughs> instead you can say, you know what, now we need to up the ante on your project. What are you going to do? So yeah. uh, I, I've mentioned, I think like, uh, I'll mention again, there was a, I had a um, client who, who would, would, well, she'd do things with her daughter. She, she, she would write letters to people that she hadn't, Spoke with for a while, and then she'd walk them down to the post office. That was her cardio. So she every day she'd go down there and send some letters. It was like I don't know how long. It was a couple mile walk. Yeah. Um, or you go and you clean your house out. You're all the junk, you know. Or instead of like the landscaper that you've been paying, you start doing that stuff yourself, or you work with them. Yeah. So something more productive. Or yeah. you go and become a volunteer. You volunteer at the local animal shelter, you know, or, or the local soup kitchen, or what have yeah. you. And you're expending energy and you're maybe even forming social connections or you're cleaning up your energy and cleaning up your space, cleaning up your house. You're giving yourself something to show. And then like when the, sh- when the, when the show's over, you don't look around and say, oh my God, my life is. I remember hearing this a long time ago, <coughs> back in Arizona. And I'd only been competing for a few years. There's a guy who ended up winning the show. It looked phenomenal. And it was like the morning of the show, you know, I was excited. I'm like, I can't wait to get on stage. It's going to be great. And he's sitting there at the prejudging meeting and talking to a buddy. And I was kind of chatting a little bit with him. He's like, man, I just, I got, I just can't wait for this shit to be over. I just got, I got, I got to talk with my girlfriend again. I got to quit this fucking smoking thing. So he's smoking to keep uh, his appetite low. You know, he's like, he's like, my life is in shambles, man. I'm, I mean, this is the best I've ever looked, but it was just like, it was such a contradiction. He had a great time on stage, and he looked great. He dominated the show. It was like great physique. But he had sacrificed so much, which I can understand. It's there's, there's not, like, not like I disagree with the idea that if, to have extreme results and to produce, to do extremely extraordinary things in life, there needs to be somewhat of a unidimensional one yeah. mindset. There needs to be a commitment to that to make it happen. Yeah. But this is a way, I think, if you're just looking for caloric expenditure, and you're not trying to do stuff that, you know, is going to be counter to the stimulus that you produce with the growth in the gym, you can be creative. We can also be humans. We don't have to be robots. Yeah, we yeah. Be humans and find fun, good stuff to do that keeps us moving. You know, it could be just like, hey, you know, I'm going to go walk the mall. Not that you can do this so much with COVID. Now. I'm going to go walk the park, you know, with with a, a different friend. I'm going to invite a different friend. We're coming. It's, it's our walk time. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna. This is my car to come join. We're gonna just chit chat about whatever. We're gonna gossip. People love to yeah. gossip. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's a conversation from what I understand. Yeah. And do some fun, cool stuff that we enjoy, that we love, yeah. and keep you occupied and keep you connected with those people. So at the end of those 12 or 16 weeks of dieting, it's like you know what? I had 18 conversations with Sally, who I hadn't spoken with for six months previous to this prep. And I really realized how much I miss her and I love her and I want to have her in my life. 
and we're going to yeah. keep this going afterwards. You know, as opposed to, well, I haven't talked to Sally for 10 months now. I have no idea what she's doing, and she's probably had two boyfriends since that time. I've, I've, yeah. you know, I've totally disconnected from her. Like the, the, the trajectories can be so diabolically different depending on what you do with that hour or two of your time. Yeah. Driving to the gym, all those sorts of things. So that's what I like to do as far as cardio goes. Yeah. And it makes yeah. sense physiologically. It makes sense, you know, as far as health. It makes sense as far as psychological health. It could be anything from time alone, like little projects. I mean, I'm a person. Here's another last kind of point. I'm a person who, like, I'll go down rabbit holes. I can get on, you know, get online. This is the best way to expend energy. But as far as keeping someone from eating, like, tell me something to look up online. And I'll be like, next thing you know, five hours have passed. <laughs> and I've downloaded 14 papers to my database, you know, yeah. and I know about, you know, some shit that I have no, knew, knew nothing about. I'll probably forget tomorrow, but yeah. I'll come across again. And, I, and I, I haven't been hungry at all because I've been totally preoccupied. So yeah. someone, you could just be like, just pick a project like you're going to like build a model ship, you know, yeah. or something like that. You know, model, like build, yeah, a, build a dollhouse for your, for your, for your daughter. Yeah, you know, yeah. not expending any energy, but you're spending time doing something that's fun and different, and yeah. not when you otherwise would be. Yeah. And then you've got like, so what? Is, so what is? Well, I got I got fifth place in the novice middleweight category, and I got like this little dinky, you know, medal, and the the thing with it fell off, and yeah, but my life's falling apart. <laughs> yeah, and my daughter hates me. Like I missed my daughter's yeah. graduation because I was ketotic and blah blah. No. Actually, I have a picture of my daughter with the dollhouse I made for her, and it's her favorite thing yeah. ever, and she'll never forget it. Yeah, yeah. So that so kind of stuff. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, I think, the thing that's, that we can do more of in yeah, body, definitely. In life, you know. But anyway, that's my thought on so, cardio. W- one final thing, Scott, if we could. I just wondered what your thoughts are, just for people watching, on if someone's taking anabolics and they're not. Should the training differ? Should their food intake differ? I know, again, it's it's a generalisation we're making there rather than individual, but just to try and do that, would you suggest that maybe to give a few more days off to recover a little bit more or, you know, maybe not quite as many calories and, and things like that? Depends on the person. Yeah. Um, so if we compare, there's different ways to look at this. So we compare a natural athlete with an, with an assisted athlete. So the natural person might be, you know, bench pressing 100 and 225 pounds for sets of 10, as the assisted guy might be using 315. Mm-hmm. So um, it could be in those both of those situations, you've got the the assisted athlete who now is because of being assisted is available is able to evoke a greater stimulus and train harder, but they also have the assistance to allow that to happen. They're basically, if they train at that level, they're in, they're in dynamic equilibrium. They're recovering yeah. and training in a certain way, and that's where they are. As, and, the, and the unassisted person can't pick up the heavier loads, mm-hmm. but they're also not evoking as much of a stress because they can't do that. And they're also in sort of dynamic equilibrium. Now, mm-hmm. now it could be that in order to like be in that place where they're not making any gains, this is just sort of a, a, a thought experiment here just for the sake of explaining Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. That that guy who's assisted can train um, every three days, and the person who's not assisted can train every five days. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be that it's actually the other way around. Yeah. Sometimes, um, because uh, the person ends up training um, so hard that they need, even with the, they're able to do that because they've made those gains with the gear but they actually still need more recovery. It, it allows them to make those gains and gotten where they've gotten, but their recovery isn't that greatly impacted. So now they need five days as opposed to just three days. If they, yeah. if they had stayed natural, if their twin brother, if the twin brother who can train more frequently. So it comes down to like what allows them to do what. And I, I talk about, I had a, a sort of a beta testing group for fortitude training many years ago. And I had a couple, couple people who um, both trained really, really hard, both competitors, one was natural, one was not. One was almost pro level, would actually could have gotten his pro card if he persisted. And the other, um, you know, didn't have the greatest genetics at all. And that guy could train with uh, volume tier three all the way up through a prep. Whereas the other guy who was like categorically different, much more impressive bodybuilder, um, 
who was, you know, also assisted, he could only train with volume tier one. They both trained right. really, really hard. Yeah. yeah. But much heavier loads, training as hard as he could. He was a hardy guy. He was, wasn't like he was, um, he wasn't wimpy about this at all. Train, that was part of it. He trained so friggin' hard. And he yeah. was so close to his, his well, uh, we'll call them genetic limitations because, you know, you're, obviously it's your genes that are under the influence of the drugs that allow you to have the adaptation. So you're still having pushed beyond your genetics by using drugs. It's still your genes that limit what happens and how you grow and adapt, what you can do. So he was way up there in terms of his genetic limitations. And, but his genes were also such that he couldn't recover all that well. Was well, the other person, I'm guessing his, his lineage might have been such that, you know, he was just sort of a hardworking, you know, really hardy, like keep slagging away every single day, but he just couldn't yeah. make gains. Losing body fat was very hard for him and et cetera, et cetera. So there's going to be a lot of differences there. So yeah. maybe, so that's, that's sort of a general idea. It's not like you don't want to reinvent the wheel and just say, okay, now I can just train like an absolute idiot because I'm on. Um, yeah. Things will, will change. If you, if you're on and you've come off, obviously then you've lost something there and you want to, especially if you end up going hypogonadal because you haven't done a PCT or you, you're not planning on it, then you have to uh, adjust. Yeah. Um, but the main thing that is going to happen there that in, at least in, in my opinion is that your recovery abilities will, will be less. It doesn't mean that you still shouldn't train as hard as you possibly can and mm -hmm. train with an appropriate volume so that you evoke a stimulus but don't don't create such a prolonged recovery period that you can't train with some regularity, mm -hmm. you know, once to twice a week at least. Yeah, if, yeah. If, if, you know, if you do twenty five sets and you can't train for two weeks, then that's probably not going to work. <laughs> you're doing one set and you're training every week. That probably isn't enough. But training as hard as you possibly can is important, and that's that's one of the things that, in that case, someone I would say train with the volume that you can recover from as hard as you possibly can. The, the very nature of the resistance training stimulus is that it is so extraordinary compared to what we normally encounter during our day-to-day -day life because yeah. the effort levels are so crazy and also sort of to some degree in particular because of the nature of lifting things up and putting them down, especially the eccentrics being very, very important where there's more tension per unit muscle. And I, I just can't help but think, and this is just an armchair evolutionary biologist perspective on this, that that the, the, the fact that you'd pick something up and then for some, some reason you'd have to put it back down, meaning that it was like you were unable to achieve the lift. You couldn't get it up to the higher spot where you're trying to and you just you had to put it back down because you weren't strong enough. Or you try, you're trying to get up and someone was stronger than you and they pushed you back down. Yeah, You can think of various scenarios you know, during um, uh, uh, maybe a, a – a, a primitive man's struggle where he, he isn't strong enough to just lift things up. And for whatever reason, things are too heavy or external forces are forcing things down upon him in a yeah. way that forces him to do lots of eccentric contractions where he's being overcome by gravity or an external force that suggests that would send a signal. If we're just thinking like teleologically, what would, what would nature be trying to say there is like, you're not strong enough for whatever whatever stresses are around. You can't pick that thing up and just it's not getting high enough. You have to put it down again, yeah. or keep on getting forced into lengthening contractions by forces that are stronger than you can overcome. Eccentric contractions seem to be those which suggest that there's some external force which is beyond what what you can normally handle. Because normally you would not pick things up and put them down repeatedly. Yeah. Unless you're moving yeah. furniture and you don't know where you're trying to put it, like <laughs> that's not what you do. That's just that's yeah. just a bizarre, weird thing to do. You pick it up, yeah. put it where it's gonna go, and then you just keep kind of so those eccentrics are really, really important, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um so those don't come about in normal day-to-day -day life. No. Those come about weight training. So that that intensity of effort, the nature of that concentric, eccentric couple contraction that we do as a rep one repetition, those are the things you have to keep in place. That's the quality, that's the nature of the stimulus, which makes it such a good way to grow muscle, in my mind yeah, at least. Yeah. So yeah. don't give up on that. Don't You wouldn't want to, um, just like I have in the Fortitude Training Intensive Cruises or, or Taper, if your recovery abilities have gone down or you need to like 
um, rebuild some recovery resources as you would during a cruise, or they've gone down because now you've come off and you don't have mm-hmm. that assistance anymore. Don't sacrifice the nature of the stimulus, the one who brung you, um, yeah. by yeah. training like a, like a, a wimp. Yeah. Keep training as hard as you can, but only in the amounts you can recover from. Yeah. And would you recommend, Scott, that people do come off? Because the trend oh. nowadays is that people just stay on forever, which seems crazy to me. But Yeah. I, I mean, everyone's, you know, I would recommend that people don't commit suicide. But, you know, sometimes people, if someone is in constant, continuous pain, they have terminal mm-hmm. cancer and they can't stand to take another, another breath, then who am I to say? Yeah. I would, yeah. I would suggest, you know, here's the thing. I think. I think when people start for the first time, that is the most important step in that decision-making process is, yeah. is because they may not know themselves well enough to know what they're going to do down the long run. And of yeah. course, there's various potential health outcomes of just being on gear, everything from you know neurotoxicity of things like trenbolone that leads to changes in the brain that brain look like Alzheimer's disease, things of that nature that are pretty like, Oh shit, you know, we're, we're screwing up our cognitive processes to, yeah. you know, I, I can't have kids. I don't, I don't think, I don't, I don't even like women, man. I don't want to have kids. Like screw that. <laughs> I'm not that down ever. You, that's how you feel when you're 23. But when you're, when you're 43 and you're alone and you'd like to have a family and you can't, then that's something yeah. that, you know that you that you could be missing out on. So coming off is something that obviously is going to probably be better for your health, unless you end up being hypogonadal. That's not a good place to be either. No, yeah, um, yeah. Just from a pure health standpoint, I think no one's going to argue that that being off steroids is better than being on them. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. If someone, for instance, is in a scenario like this is all case specific, it's all context, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. Uh, world class bodybuilder. Maybe they live in the Middle East, where the government basically um, pays them to be a world class athlete. Like they get yeah. a house, get a stipend, you know, and they just have to stay, you know, top of the. They can set themselves up like societally as being a champion, where they've got esteem and they've got respect. And they can get a job afterwards because of what they did for the country. The sacrifice, like an Olympic athlete, someone's Olympic gold medal winner. You know, and they go into a business and say, hey, you know, I, I like to apply for a job. It's like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, of course. Like, you know, thank you so much. We should do the same thing for our vets, I think, but for the topic. Yeah. But for some some people in some circumstances, staying on continuously could be a very, a, a very um, easily uh, justifiable risk, I would think. Yeah. That I would yeah. have no place in saying, you know, oh, you know, you should come off. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Six months, I don't look that good. I'm not going to have any advertisements. I can't get the guest posings, you know. And I was ninth in the Olympia. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. When I take time off, I I just can't get back to where I once was. I'm going to have to stay on a little bit longer, or I'm going to yeah. take some time off. So that's one perspective. A- another perspective is that. You don't know until you've tried it. A lot of people find staying on isn't always the best thing for long-term progress as a bodybuilder. In fact, it's probably not. Yeah. Because having that time off will resensitize someone to the gear when they add it back on. And I've seen this many, many times where someone's been on or like they've kind of done a PCT or never really kind of stepped away. And then yep. some of my circumstance, the health scare or just a change of heart or what have you, and they step off, step away, and then they add things back in. And next thing you know, they're like, they're like in their 40s or they're like, yeah, it's like, how did you all of a sudden you're better than you ever were in yeah. like nine months and you spent 10 years getting to where that last best was. It's like, what happened? It's like, I just took six months off. Yeah. So yeah. that that is a very good reason for coming off for many, many cases that, it, you know, two steps forward, one step back, that one step back can be what launches you to three or four steps forward to where you previously were. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something to say for that. So again, it depends on the context. On the time individual, you, absolutely. Yeah. You know, but you know, the main issues are really how badly are they affected by the side effects? Are, are you, are you relinquishing your ability to choose whether you stay on or off because of the nature of your personality, like some people are kind of addictive and, you know, in the mm-hmm. nature, like, yeah. especially now, and it's, I, I really, I have to recognize that I can't completely empathize with younger 
people now because they have grown up in a world where their psychology and their sociology are intimately intertwined with social media in a way that they can't extract those two things. Yeah. So what you look like on your social media pictures where you go post pictures of yourselves and your buddies at the beach or the gym or what have you is intimately connected with who you see yourself to be in this world. Yeah. And if steroids have become integrated into that, it would be like telling someone, you know, you know, well, should you just remove your left hemisphere of your cerebral cortex? It's like, that's like half of my personality. Like, yeah. uh, what do you mean? It's like, well, that's possibly what you're doing to some degree. If someone starts on gear and the nature of their world is so interwoven with their physical appearance that they don't really even have a viable choice. I'm not saying people can't make do these things, but I can't, I can't put myself in their shoes entirely because of yeah. just the generation that I grew up in is that yeah. they can't viably choose to come off mm -hmm. to some degree and knowing, yeah. recognizing like this can be a one way street for you or one that's going to be like, you're dealing, doing a deal with the devil. You're, you're shaking hands with Mephistopheles here and he may never let you out of this contract yeah. because of the nature of the world that you live in. And, you know, it may look great and you may get lots of likes and like, you know, nice biceps and people hitting you up through your DMs or whatever it may be. But um, you may be like, literally it's it's you may be signing a, a social contract that you can't you don't have the psychological wherewithal to break away from if you start. So yeah. that's I mean, I can't reiterate that too much. So coming off yeah. is great for ways, but. That is important, you know, not knowing whether or not you're going to have kids. If, if you just do a PCT and, and do a sperm mobility, a sperm test, a fertility test, which I think you can, government may even do that there in the UK. You can get that done, I believe. Possibly, yeah, 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 yeah um, I would think so. And uh, Power PCT is something people can look up. Uh, I've done a podcast with a former client, and he okay. was able to, to come off, and he has a wonderful baby girl now. Um, um, well, so. yeah, that, that's a possibility, but... Some people recover differently than others. So being able to recover and knowing like, you know, let's say you just come off every two years for six months. Is it going to matter? No, but you may find like, you know what? I came off for six months. I got my testosterone back. My FSH, my LSH are back. And my sperm didn't come back. Mm -hmm. So I got, I may be, I may have made myself infertile unless I come off for a longer period of time. So that may be something, at least you know. Yeah. You took some yeah. months off. You took some time off. At least you have an idea just to see yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. what the damage is that you could be causing. So you just never know. So it's um, that's a long answer. It's a very complex yeah, no, thing, yeah, yeah. thing. But Absolutely. Um, it just could be a one way street in a way that you don't, you can't predict because everyone's different. Some people, I've got, I've known guys who just, they come on and off and they, there's no change in their sex drive and they're good to go and everything recovers. It's like, like they have these these hypothalamic pituitary testicular axes that are just like they're, they're like immutable. They're like they're like you know, just shine the gamma rays on me, like drop me in the nuclear reactor, <laughs> throw me into outer space. I my I have Superman's testicles. They can just recover from everything. <laughs> you know, just keep me away from the kryptonite and I'm good to go. And then other people they do one cycle. Like I've been to Body Power a, a few times, and I've I've got like a, a anabolic steroids 101 or PEDs 101 lecture right. I gave there a couple of times and. One year, a couple of young guys came up to me, um, two brothers, actually, one who had gone on for a while, used some SARMs, some other things, and the other who had decided not to. And the, the first guy was so thankful because I was just talking about like basic aspects of endocrinology, what the drugs do, how they work, PCT, what the notions behind that was. And he, like he said, like what you just told me is, has multiplied my understanding of this topic um, by tenfold compared to what I gathered with everything I possibly can for years. I've had, I known what you told me now, I mean, I would have saved myself so many years of trouble because he went on, he was, a, you know, in his late teens, early twenties, went on and then couldn't recover and didn't know what to do. and didn't know how to do it. And he tried yeah. everything and he suffered like massive depression. Yeah. It was horrible, terrible yeah. thing for him, you know, and he didn't have a way, I don't think even to continue getting the steroids if he wanted to like just stay on and so he could find an easier way out. So that's the other thing is like you may not you may not have a choice once you start. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, once you've gone down that. Yeah. So I think I think people um, when I say people because it's just you know it's it's a very common thing that 
because it's so common, especially because through the warped lens of social media, to see lots of amazing physiques of people who are um, enhanced. <clears throat> to think, well, it's no big deal, you know. Just do it, and you're good. You're good to go. And yeah. they really don't have a deeper understanding of what of what they're doing, what's going on. And I'm not like trying to stand on my high horse, my soapbox here, but mm. you'd want to you want to have an idea. Here's here's an example. Um, one of my dogs, she's probably back here someplace, but she's got Cushing syndrome right. and excessive produ- production of cortisol. And so with the Western vets, they wanted to um, prescribe. There's two different basic medications. I forget the name of them now. And basically, I asked one of the vets, "How do those work?" And they don't usually get those types of questions. And the one vet couldn't even tell me. So I went and looked up the name of the drug. The drugs basically, they kill off the cortisol producing cells in the adrenal glands. It's a one way street. Too much cortisol. We'll just ablate those cells. We'll just take them out. Then you don't have cortisol. And then you may just have to add cortisol back to get you at neutral level. So that's the solution. I'm like, is there any other way around that? And so we started using Chinese medicine. I use, I have a TCM vet. And we do food and herbs, those sorts of things that she's been doing better. But the point was, is that even this vet, who's the doctor, didn't know how the drug works. And it's like the most, like this is the drug, Cushing's, you know, if Cushing's, then this drug or these two drugs. And they both destroy, they literally destroy those cells. Cortisol is a pretty basic hormone. Yeah. It's not like this obscure, like. I heard about this like a dipocyte satiety factor type of thing, which you know is this crazy cytokine that you know no one's ever heard about, but you know it works through that. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. No, it's cortisol. We're just going to take out all the cortisol producing cells. Anabolic steroids are basically they work at a very fundamental basic level, and they disrupt your reproductive axis. Yeah. That's, I mean, if, if you're on the page that I am, that there are differences biological between men and women, there's actually a physiological, biological genetic difference between a man and a woman, that, those hormonal differences are at the root of that. Yeah. And that's what you're messing with, with, with gear. Yeah. yeah. And that's okay, yeah. and that's not, not right or wrong, but people don't, don't really recognize what it is that they're, that they're playing with. It's kind of like, doing, yeah. yeah, it's like you want your car to run faster? Just pour some of this stuff in there in the in the tank, and it's like, yeah. what is? It? I don't know. It smells <laughs> really bad. It's some petroleum product. It's like you know better. Like you can't put diesel in a regular unleaded yeah. gas and vice versa. You just can't like you know just put some cooking oil in there. Like it would work in a diesel, but it's not. You can't do that. People yeah. would just know like that's a good way to fuck up your car. Well, it, you might make your car run faster for a little while, but you're it literally at a very fundamental level. You're introducing. Um, analogs to the basic quintessential male androgen testosterone that disrupts the body's own production of testosterone yeah and you gotta you gotta just have a basic understanding of what you're doing before you make that leap and people don't talk about people don't say um you know like uh so i decided i was gonna i just uh, I, I decided that you know i take the chance and disrupt my hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis we shut down, you know, the, those, uh, those gonadotrophins and the gonadotrophin releasing hormones. I decided to sacrifice that basic core endocrinology, endocrinological thing that makes me a man because I want to, like, like, that's what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. It's like absolutely. kind of a leap. Yeah. It's like a, it's a huge mod. Like, you want to mod your car to run on different fuels? You don't have every, you know, you can't go down in the mechanic and say, I just want to run, I want to run my car off olive oil. <laughs> can't yeah. do that like i've looked yeah. at this from my from my my diesel engine i want to run on, on cooking oil there's there's all these systems and they're expensive and like you can kind of do it it's a long sorted story but it's a very big thing to do so i say that yeah. hopefully some people will listen to this and think wow i never thought about it that way but that's really mm-hmm. what you're doing so yeah, if you definitely. keep that in mind you think well, there's some gravity to this decision and it's one that's going to impact who i think i am socially who i become socially who i think i am psychologically with women, it's an entirely different story as to what it can do to their to them psychologically. It's categorically different. Literally, it can be a personality changer. And this is I've I've heard this from women competitors that I've known. It can change like who they are to a certain degree. Yeah, and yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. We're all changing who we are. We're all figuring out who we are. You know, yeah, unveiling yeah. who we truly really are. But recognizing what you're doing, you know, when you go in, 
so that when you're signing on that dotted line, the small print becomes large. And you're like, okay, this could be, you know, this could, this could change my life as much as anything. No kids can't come off these drugs, can't travel because of all the, so many different ramifications that we just don't think about because yeah, yeah. it's the nature of, but the UK is much better in the States. It's such, it's such a taboo thing to talk about. You have to be secret, you know, and keep hidden <laughs> at least. At least personal yeah. use, you know, isn't frowned upon yeah. there. And you can talk about it. So it's yeah. much more open. But so, yeah, coming off has those advantages. It can resensitize you. It can be better for your health. Let you know if, you're, if your HPTA is up and running and if you're, if you're maintaining fertility and doing that. Saves you money. Um, keeps that psychological, you know, like how bad is my body dysmorphia? I'm going to find out here in a little bit yeah, when true. I shrink down. Yeah. And get your blood, and get your blood work done because a lot of people still oh. don't do that. That goes, yeah. That I didn't. Talk, that goes without saying, but of course, yeah. yeah. Getting your blood work while you're off and cleaned up is different than while you're on, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's like, oh, good to go. It's like, no, your blood work was for shit for those two years. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, that's what caused the problem. So, yeah, yeah. yeah so, it, in general, yes, but you know, I can't tell anyone what to do. That's that's totally up to them. But hopefully, that gives food for thought. You know, and that's brilliant. Really, yeah, it's great stuff. So I think we'll wrap it up here, Scott, if that's okay. But um, where can people find you? Where can they get your books from? Um, you know, do they just go on on your? Um, have you got a website or what? What's the what's the deal with that? Yeah, I mean, if they can just remember Scott Stevenson Bodybuilding, they'll find me. Um, FortitudeTraining.net is my takes you to every. I've got various. You there's Doctor Scott Stevenson. There's FortitudeTraining.net. You can type in be your own bodybuilding coach.com and it takes you there too. Right. So, okay. Yeah. You can find me pretty easy on Facebook and Instagram with Fortitude Training. Pops up pretty well, I think. So great stuff. Well, that's been fantastic. Um, I've got a million questions for you. So hopefully we can maybe do it again at some point if that's okay. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's been fun at least for a bit. So um, I just thank you very much, Dr. Scott Stevenson. And hopefully we'll talk again very soon. Yeah. Congrats on the podcast. Thank you very much. Take care.